Now, why have I chosen this? Because the book opened on that page. That's one reason. And I opened the book. That was the song. Another reason we chose it is because it's a very beautiful song. And another reason is, is because very soon, this year, we have every, every culture has a calendar. Every culture has their events, just like the last few weeks in Cebu was a very big festival for Santa Nino. We were seeing the end of it when we were there a few days ago. And still many people were celebrating parades, carrying Santa Nino in procession, a very nice, beautiful deities and festivals and music. And very nice. Celebrating Jesus, glorifying Jesus is wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Jai. I thought you were going to make a garland with pizzas. <laughs> Different varieties here. Yeah. Varieties of pizzas. Um, so, especially we see in the culture of India, which is generally understood to be the oldest religion in the world, the religions of India, even by Western calculation. And culturally speaking, not everyone agrees, but anthropologi anthropologically, that means by studying the nature and the soils and what have you, calculating ages, the, in the civilization of India does go back a lot further than any other, even with their calculation. When you have to bear in mind that basically there was no such thing as burial, everyone was cremated, Buildings were made of mud. They didn't waste their time building like we do now. They lived simply. But they had a high culture, very high culture, in terms of spiritual culture, in terms of human values. Not in terms of material assets or, you know, technology, but in terms of uh, character, human character, quality of life. Uh, families, everything was very, very organized in that regards. Occupation, simple. Nowadays things are very complicated. Everything's very complicated. They would try to keep things simple so more time was available for spiritual pursuit and for religious practice and for human behavior, cultivating good qualities. So they didn't leave behind what we look for most of the time, you know, buildings made of, you know, rocks or cement. They had those also. And they've discovered, for instance, in the Sindhu Valley, they've discovered clearly it's an educational institute. It's going to the scientists, the anthropologists, which is estimated to be between seven and 8,000 years old by their calculations. Now, that's a long time ago. And they see that the engineering and everything of that building was very advanced. The drainage, very advanced. So you can't say that there was no civilization there, that they were cave dwellers, forest dwellers, uncivilized, uneducated. It wasn't everyone was that way, but there was a class of society who was very, very, very intelligent, advanced society. So, uh, how do we get on to that? Festivals. Festivals. Culture. Every culture has its festivals. So, this is nothing new. In our line, in India, there are many different lines of practice. Of different. India is made up of at least 30 different nations, basically. All under one banner. Working more or less together. And uh, each one of them has their own uniqueness, their own cuisine. If anyone's traveled around India, you'll see that the cuisine of the south of India is radically different to, say, Punjab. You've been to Tamil Nadu? Yeah, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from South India. Which part? Hyderabad. Hyderabad? Yeah. Uh, Tarangano. What do they call it now? Telangano? Telangano. It used to be Andhra Pradesh, now they've made two states out of one, Telangana and Andhra. So they're the Telugu 
They also had their own cuisine, you could say. And they have their own variety of rituals, their own worshipable deities. Other places have the same ones, but you'll see that there's a, you know, changes and more emphasis in Tamil Nadu. They mostly they worship more uh, Lord Shiva, Murugan, Amun, like that. Uh, not so much Krishna. There are temples of Krishna in Tamil Nadu, big ones, Sri Rangam, very big temple of Ranganath there of Lord Vishnu, lining. many temples are also there, especially the older ones. In Tamil Nadu you'll see some of the most beautiful temples in India. They were not destroyed so much by the Mughals or the Muslims when they invaded India. They didn't go there much. And then you get in Kerala, there are temples of Krishna there. Andhra Pradesh there are many temples of Ramchandra, especially Nishingadev, Krishna also. But especially Lord Nishingadev and Ramchandra worship there. Other places in Gujarat, Krishna is very prominent, as well as, of course, Durga. Um, and in northern India, many varieties. There's some places in Bengal and Marissa, you see Lord Chaitanya and Jagannath more. Everywhere different. They have very different. For a Bengali, very difficult, if they, for instance, to live in Punjab. Where in Punjab, they like wheat. They like heavy, heavy, you know, bread and heavy chickpeas and it's very strong diet, lots of milk. Strong diet. No not so much rice. In Bengal, they don't know they do now, but they would never eat wheat. It was all rice. Rice, rice and more rice. And Tamil Nadu also, rice, rice and more rice. You know, we went for you know, we were I was on Padiatra in Tamil Nadu for some time and the early 90s. And uh, we were, every day it was rice and curry. Rice and, they call it rasan. It wasn't even curry. It's just hot soup. Soupy preparation. Rice and, and rasam, you know, every day practically. And it, they, they're happy just eating rice in the villages and stuff. And then one day they said, oh, today's a feast day. I thought, Whew, maybe we'll get some vegetables today. No, it was curd rice, tomato rice, tamarind rice, sweet rice, lemon rice, turmeric rice, plain rice, about ten different rice preparations, and chutney, tamarind chutney, tomato chutney, coconut chutney, with some vada, fried vada, very nice vada, very nice. No vegetables at all. All rice and a few little things to go with it. <laughs> That's a feast, rice and more rice. If you did that to someone in Bengal, or so, in, um, well, even Bengal, they like their vegetables there. And in Punjab especially, if you just gave them rice, they, what is this, you know? Everywhere is different, you know. But they've got, all got their, and they recognize other festivals like Shivratri, Janmastami. You know, these festivals are celebrated everywhere in different degrees, of course, Ram Nomi. Different degrees, just like now the Ram Temple is opened in Ayodhya, and not everyone agrees, but throughout the whole of India, people were celebrating, you know. It wasn't just Ram. Everyone accepts Ram as one of the gods, at least, you know. He's very popular because he could say he was a little bit more human, a little bit more down to earth in some ways, in some ways, not in other ways. I mean, the Battle of Lanka is definitely superhuman. In, uh, you know, it's like a, something people dream about or put on some you know, fictional movies or something, but it's a reality. Um, but they were just on a higher level of capacity, ability, and mystic power and everything else. So we have our festivals too. Many festivals. In fact, Prabhupada said, we're not ready, but he said, I could give you a festival every day of the year to celebrate. But we have some selected ones, prominent ones. In our annual calendar, what would be the most prominent festival, would you say? And go, I'm talking to the devotee, Vaishnava devotee. What's the most prominent festival? Pardon? Just Vaishnava, let's say Vaishnava in general. In general. What was that, what someone said? Jan Mastami, okay. Krishna's birthday, probably amongst all Vaishnavas, I'm not saying everywhere, but probably the most popular is Jan Mastami. Almost everyone celebrates Jan Mastami. And even many Muslim people celebrate Jamastami too. 
they also, you know, honor it because it's something they're brought up with. It's part of their culture, of India, that is, not of their religion. Uh, what are we, another famous festival amongst most Hindus, Hindus in general? Pardon? Louder? Not necessarily, no. That's specific. That's Gaudiya Vaishnav. No one else celebrates that. In the whole of India, no one celebrates. They do, they do celebrate that day, but it's not Gorponim. They have another name for it. Holi. Holi. It's a holy festival on the same day as Gorponim. And for most people, that's the festival of colors. And a uh, very interesting festival. We don't get into that. It is a festival. It's not so much of a... It's a little different. It's more of a party festival. It's not, it's not like, you know a worship festival, it's more of a party. Like Christmas, for most people, it's become like a party rather than a worship. Huh? But worship, days of worship, what would be next? Jamasmi is definitely one. There are two or three others. Huh? Diwali. Throughout the whole of India, practically, everyone Diwali. celebrates Diwali, right? Tamil, like from Tamil Nadu to Punjab to Bengal, everyone celebrates Diwali. It may be the biggest, in fact. It has many purposes. It's not just Vaishnav, this, that, the other. There are many historical claims to that day. It's mostly related to Lord Ramachandra. But everyone celebrates that. Throughout the whole, it's a national holiday. They make it a national holiday in, in, in Malaysia, even, Muslim country. They've made Diwali a national holiday. You know, it's a Muslim country by government. Many countries recognize, in, in England, they celebrate it in the Houses of Parliament, Diwali. British government celebrates Diwali to recognize the Hindu community. Many of the members of government are Hindus, including the Prime Minister. So, you know, it's becoming known all over the world. Diwali is known all over the world. I think even in America, many places, they have a holiday on Diwali now. It's probably the main one amongst the Hindus is Diwali, probably. Another one which is really big, maybe even bigger than Jamasti for many, do you know what that is? Hmm? Shivatri. Shivaratri. Very, very big. Festival. We honor it. We don't make a big thing of it, but we certainly honor it. Um, Shivaratri is another big one. And there are others too. But those three come to mind probably as the main ones. There may be a few others you think of. Then there's the more local ones, and then there's those of particular religious movements. Uh, like in Gaudiya Vaishnav, you already mentioned two. Uh, Rathyatra is a, doesn't mean anything in it itself, because it could be, Rathyatra means literally, you know, a chariot festival. It could be a chariot festival for anyone. Um, they might have a chariot festival for a, a musician or a cricket player or anybody. It's not, it's not definitive. So we call Jagannath Rathyatra. But that is very well known in Orissa and in Bengal and a few other states. But in most of India, uh, Jagannath Rath Yatra is almost unheard of, right? Jagannath. They had their own Rath Yatras. You had the, in this now the installation of the deity in Ayodhya. In Paris, they had a Ram Rath Yatra. The Hindu community, thousands of them came together for a Ram Rath Yatra. They, took, they didn't really have a Rath Yatra quite the way we do, but down the back of a truck, they had a, you know, pictures or effigy of Ram Chandra. And they went to different spots around the city. So that could be any, any deity. It could be Amun, could be Shiva, could be whatever, Lakshmi Narayan, Ramchandra, Rathyatra. So that's a Gaudiya Vaish, Jagannath, Rathyatra. And you mentioned another one, Gorpurnima. What other festivals do go? Let's look at Vaishnavas in general, then Gaudiya Vaishnavas. What festivals do Vaishnavas in general celebrate? That means devotees of Krishna. What do they celebrate? We've mentioned a few. Ram. Some more? Pardon? Ram. Well, we kind of mentioned Ram. But Ram Nomi, yes. We've mentioned Gopanim already. Radhastami, okay. Not all of them celebrate that. They don't accept Radharani. Gaudiya Vaishnavas do. Madhava Cham Sampradaya does not. Pardon? Yeah, not everyone celebrates that. That's, again, a little limited. Uh, well, yeah, you could say that about all of them, really. I suppose you could say in one sense. Because Vaishnavas vary intensely in their 
wor- to style of worship. And many of the festivals we observe are more related to, you could say, uh, spontaneous devotional service rather than Aishwarya or reverential service. For instance, in South India, the Sri Sampadaya uh, is very, very, very popular amongst Vaishnavas. In Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh also, Sri Vaishnavas are very popular. And if you go to uh, Karnataka, some everywhere overlapping is there, but you find the Madhava Sampadaya, huh? very popular. The Brahma Madhava Sampadaya, very popular. Both those Sampadayas worship Krishna, but they worship Krishna more in the form of Lakshmi Narayan. And it's very reverential, if you know, reverential, very ritualistic worship. It's not very spontaneous, it's very ritualistic. A lot of rules, regulations, wonderful principles, very devotional in that sense, but it's very reverential and very impressive. Lord Chaitanya very much, uh, you know, spent time there and appreciated their worship and especially their service to devotees and so on. Um, and Srila Prabhupada also. Tirupati, which is in Andhra Pradesh, is one of the main seats of the Sri Sampradaya, beautiful temple on the mountain. And uh, there Prabhupada said, we should go there and learn. We should go there and learn how to look after guests. Very, for what it is, very, very expertly done. Organized. Anyone can go there free of charge. There's a place for you to stay. There's free prasadam for tens of thousands of people at any time. And there's nice chalets and bungalows if you want to rent at a very cheap price. You know, it's very organized for the darshan. Everything organized. Everything's there, free dispensaries, so many things. Organized to receive your guests very nicely. So Prabhupada said we should learn from them. He said, in, for then we go to the other end of the country. You go to Punjab. Punjab's mixed. You've got a lot of Sikh people there. You've got a lot of Hindus also, Muslims also. So you go to Amritsar, the famous main place of the poor of the Sikh, Sikhs, but there, you know, they, there's probably said, wow, we should learn from them also. The way they're serving prasadam and the way they prepare prasadam, they have their own prasadam, they, they have their own offerings, and they distribute a fantastic prasadam in a super organized way. Tons and tons of it. You go to Puri, which is on another corner in Arissa, and there you see a Jagannath temple. Every day there's lorries all the time lining up to take Jagannath Prasadam all over the place. They prepare Prasadam by the ton. They don't just make a little offering on the altar and everyone scrabbles for a remnant. They're preparing like the biggest, it's the biggest kitchen in the world apparently, the temple of Jagannath House. And they're preparing tons of Prasadam round the clock practically. Fifty-four times a day or something like that they offer. Tons of Prasadam. It's like, they say that Lord Jagannath's thing, hands, he hasn't got any, but you, we, we can't, he has, but we can't see him. They're always wet, because he's either taking prasadam or washing up after, then another meal comes in front of him. I don't get any time to stop. <laughs> Eating, wash, I'm sure some of us wish we could do that too, but we can't. <laughs> There's one at the back there, that greedy young man at the back there. God, gluttonous fella. So anyway, everywhere's a little different. They have a different order of serving prasad. In some places, sweets are served first. Sometimes, savors are served first. Sometimes, rice is served first. Sometimes, rice is served last. Sometimes, you have to give, you know, some puri first. Sometimes, you don't give it at all. You know, you, you sit down, I think, is it in Gujarat or something? You sit there and you wonder, what, what's going on here? There's no rice or what? And then, right, if you've finished everything else, only then do they bring the rice around. And you're like full up to here, thinking that's all there was, you know. And the other place, if you don't put the rice there to begin with, no one starts eating anything. They, want, they can't eat a thing. You go to Bengal, it's rice isn't there straight away. They're fasting. It's a fast day. They cannot eat anything without rice, practically. And they don't eat little amounts. They eat mountains of rice. They have this unique capacity to digest rice like an elephant, practically. Little tiny shrimp, you know. Tiny little shrimp. The guy's tiny. And he's eating like two, three kilos of rice. Easily. With hot curry. No problem. I don't know what they do with it. But it goes in. 
Everyone's got their own uniqueness and festivals. What are the festivals? Govardhan Puja is re- celebrated by many Vaishnavas, not just in Vrindavan, but in many other places. But it is a little specific to those who are worshippers of Krishna, and especially those who are worshipping Radha and Krishna. But the Nimbarka Sampradaya, they also very much celebrate Govardhan Puja, very much. Madhava Sampradaya, I don't know. Sri Sampradaya, probably not. But it'll be known, they know about it, they know about Lord Chaitanya also. They just don't worship him in the same way. So we have tons of festivals throughout the year. So many wonderful festivals. You can go on and on. The list is unending. Different pastimes of Krishna that took place on that day. Personages who appeared in the world. Avatars of the Lord. We mentioned Ramchandra. Someone mentioned Nishinga Deva. And of course Krishna himself. And Lord Chaitanya. And there are many others. You know, Honored all over India. Different places they honor differently. Some, some do some parts of India, they worship Kalki. They worship Kalki's uh, appearance. Yeah. And some worship Parashuram. There's some place, especially in Kerala, they worship Parashuram. Some. And some place they worship Lord Varaha. There are many temples of Lord Varaha. A big festival on his appearance day. Eh? Vamadev. I don't know many temples of Vamadev, maybe. But I'm sure many people worship. We, we do. We honor the day of different avatars of the Lord. So uh, we also have festivals on the appearance day of great devotees or on their disappearance day. So in next month, February, I don't know the exact date, towards the end of the month, is a very special festival for members of the, uh, not even the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, but the members of the Gaudiya Vaishnav line coming in the last, say, um, in the line of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, particularly since Bhakti Siddhanta. So that's not very long ago. Uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj appeared exactly 150 years ago this year. He appeared in 1874 in Jagannath Puri. So this February, he appeared in February, February the 2nd that year, I think it was. But this year is later because the calendar is the that, that this year was Purusha Mass calendar is very late this year so it's towards the end of February this year that we'll be honoring his appearance day and it's the 150th anniversary so many devotees will be honoring Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj's 150th appearance anniversary it'll be very big the Gaudiya Math it's like the biggest festival in 50 years in, in one sense it's like he's he is like the um, he is the founder of Shire of the Gaudiya Mass, and we're also a limb of the Gaudiya Mass, but we don't honor it so exclusively as many of the other members of the Gaudiya Mass may do. But we should do in one sense, but because we have founder of Shire's Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, whom uh, we, you know, is obviously more prominent in most devotees' lives, directly speaking, you could say. So uh, we honor that generally more. But this year, in ISKCON, it's also requested, the GBC have already issued um, a, a directive to the movement that gorgeous festivals should be held for Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's appearance day, 150th anniversary. So please try to do something nice here. Where's the, where's the boss? Not the boss. In Bengal, they call everyone the boss. Any white person's the boss. Okay. Boss. Hey, boss. So where's the boss? Where? Indravali, where, where is she? Indravali, you have to make a gorgeous festival for Bhakti Siddhanta marriage this year, okay? 150th anniversary. Now, that will never occur again, not on this planet. So, make it very nice, huh? Don't, you know, don't just make a little thing. Do something, advertise it, make a nice arrangement, a beautiful Vyasasan for Bhakti Siddhanta Actually, on that day, you take Prabhupada off of his Vyasasan. Prabhupada sits low, Bhakti Siddhanta Mahārāja sits on the Vyāsa-san, which Prabhupada's on now, and you put a small Vyāsa-san, small, not that small, but I mean smaller, for uh, Śrīla Prabhupāda. Because on that day, he'll be worshipping Śrīla Bhakti Siddhanta Mahārāja with all of his heart. He would, he would be, uh, he would, I mean, you know the story one time when Prabhupāda didn't have much time with his Guru Mahārāj, but one time he went to Vrindavan when his Guru Mahārāj was on Parikrama in a place called Koshi, I think it was in Koshi, somewhere. 
And he, Prabhupada wasn't familiar with the, uh, let's say, the etiquettes particularly at that point of time. He wasn't even initiated. And uh, he, he, there was, uh, the room was crowded and, you know, there was no particular place to sit. But Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj was sitting on like a, a plinth, you know, a platform. And Prabhupada went up and sat right on the same level as the Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. And then after a while he realized, that, like, oh, 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 this is wrong. So then, you know, he was very embarrassed. But uh, the guru all, never sits on the same. I mean, in some managerial situations, in some practical situations, you see Prabhupada sitting on the same level in the airport, for instance, with his disciples. Because that's how the chair arrangement is. But in, let's say, any normal, formal situation, uh, the disciple always sits lower than the spiritual master. So Prabhupada would never sit on the same level as his Guru Maharaj. So on that day particularly, please make, as best you can, gorgeous arrangements, advertise it, have a day of remembrance and glorification of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. Um, it's a great chance. Bring everyone together. You can even invite persons who don't normally come. Of course, the Gaudiya Math will have their own festivities. They won't come anyway, even if you invite them. But others too. Try to put aside differences, put aside, you know, whatever it may have been, and put the Acharya in the center. As you may know, Prabhupada said, the secret is to put the Acharya in the center, not to put our own particular thing in the center, but the Acharya, how the Acharya would want. Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj, one of his main desires was actually to unite all Vaishnavas, not just Gaudiya, all Vaishnavas. That's why he built one temple, predominant temple in Mayapur. You'll see it, the four Sampradaya temple. There's Nimbarka and Vishnu Swami and Madhavacharya and Ramanujacharya. They're all there. They've all got their, you know, representation, their altars, their deities there in the temple. On the four corners. Four Sampradaya temple. Vajanapatna. Vajanapatna. The center of the Gaudiya Master. They have this um, for Sampradaya. He wanted the Sampradayas to, they had their own differences, but to unite and spread pure devotional service throughout the world. It's not my pure devotional service, it's better than your pure devotional service. And you, we're going to fight against you because you're pure devotion. You're not surrendering to us. You're not surrendering to us. You're our enemy. That's not Vaishnava. You may have differences, and obviously you may keep apart from, in certain areas because you have different rituals and different t inspirations and so on. But the principles are the same. That we're all the eternal servants of Krishna, and our life is meant for that purpose. So there's nothing unbecoming. If someone, if someone takes shelter of the Sri Sampadaya, it's a glorious thing to do. Although we're not interested in doing that because Lord Chaitanya has given us something even sweeter given us a chance to go on to a spontaneous, loving, devotional service le leading to prema. There's no prema as such in the Sri Sampadaya. It's reverential. Aishwarya Bhav. So they have their festivals too. Ramanujacharya's appearance day is a massive one, of course. Goes on for days. For days on end. His disappearance day even more than the appearance. So it's not either one today, but I'm just saying in a hundred, it's your 150th anniversary this year in February of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj's birth in the world. So uh, we're going to sing a song. It's related to that, and there's another reason I, I thought to sing this. Um, when I opened the book, I thought, okay, that's it. Uh, because the night before he left the planet, he requested one of his leading disciples, Srila Sridhar Maharaj, to sing this song, Sri Rupa Manjari. Indeed, the night before, and he requested another of his disciples, leading disciples to sing Sikshastakam. These two songs, bhajans, prayers, whatever, Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj wanted to hear, to absorb himself in. Now it's not surprising because we have a prayer here at the beginning of the songbook. Um, let's see. Here. Um, here. Um, Namaste Gauravani Srimurti Dinatarine Rupa Nuga Viruda Apisadanta Dwanta Harine. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you, who are the personified teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Now, who is the personified teaching of Lord Chaitanya? 
other than Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj? Rupa Goswami. And that's why we're all called Rupanugas, those who follow in the line of Rupa Goswami. So Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj is here being praised as the, that same, that same personification of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. You are the deliverer of the fallen souls. You do not tolerate any statement which is against the teachings of devotional service enunciated by Rupa Goswami. The intimate follower of his, his name, of course, what's, what's Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj in the spiritual realm? Who is he? Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. Rupa Goswami is Rupa Manjari. Who is he? You remember? Pardon? No. No, there, that's the Goswamis, Rati Manjari, Raghunath Das. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was Kamala Manjari. I can't, I'm just trying to recollect Kanis, um, Kanaka Manjari, or what's his name? It slipped my mind, I've forgotten myself. I thought maybe one of you can remember. But he's a Manjari, and he's one of the intimate, he's the intimate associate or servant of Kamala Manjari, Bhaktivinoda Thakur who is the intimate servant. He goes like this. There's a disciplic succession there. And they're all servants of Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami. They're her assistants, or his in this world. When, Ma when Rupa Manjari, who is the number one aide of, aide of camp, you could say, in Lalita's party, is, uh, comes into this world, he comes in what's called a sadhaka Rupa, a form which looks material, human. It's not, but it looks like that. And he performs practical activities of a sadhaka nature to teach others how to come to the highest perfection. So Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj in the same vein, exactly the same teaching, is doing just like that. So in this song, which we sing, we hear, and this was compiled um, by Naratam Das, who is also a Manjari, um, and this is one of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj's favorite songs. He's written a song, there's one song in here, the Sampadaya, it's the it's the uh, glorification of the Gaudiya Sampadaya, or oh, not just the Gaudiya, the Vaishnava Sampadaya, back to Lord Brahma. And he sings this song glorifying all the Acharyas back to Lord Brahma. But we're not going to sing that, it's very long. We'll sing this one, Sri Rupa Manjari Padam. Are we ready? Everyone ready? <clears throat> Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Yabhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Kinami I think it's Naina Manjari, that's it, that's it, Naina, Naina Manjari. Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Vakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasate Deve Gauravani Prachari Nirvasesha Tanyavade Vastachade Shatarine Namaste Sarasvati Deve Kauravani Pacharine Nirvasesha Tanyavade Asya-chare-satarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sade Gora Bhakta Vin Shri Krishna 
Chaitanya Prabhu Nityana Shri Arvetha Gadadha Shri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vita Namo Vishnu Bharadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Tina Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Om Jnana Timurandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Onnilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namah Om Jnana Timurandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshodhan Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Tapitam Yena Bhutale Vayam Bhupagadamayam Siddhati Svapadantikam Shri Chaitanya Manovishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupagadamayam Siddhati Svapadantikam Vanchakapatrubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyehebhyascha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Vanchakarpaturubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyehebhyascha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Manjari Pada Semara Sampada Tilopa Manjari Pada Semara Sampada Tilopa Manjari Pada Semo Sampada Tirupa Manjari Pada Semo Sampada Semo Ajana Pujana Seva Ajana Pujana Seva Ajana Oh, 
se rupa maho evashi kana kuvalaya shashi se rupa maru re vashi prana kuvalaya shashi Apulita Nishidine Apulita Nishidine Tuwa Adarshana Ahi Kavale Charalo Dehi Chua Adha Sahari Kavale Charalo Dehi Chua Adha Shana Ahi Kavale Charalo Dehi Tuva Adarshana Ahi Kavale Jahalo Dehi Chiragina Bhata Pita Jivana Chiragina Bhata Pita now we sing a little differently. Now sing both lines together. Ha ha upa koro jaya Deho mahe parachaya Naro tama bala ilo Arupa koro doya Deho mare haraya Naro sama loe lo Sarana Ha ha upa koro doya Deho mare parachaya Naro tama mala ilo sarana Deho mare parachaya Naro tama mala ilo Amanjari Pada Semara Sampada Semara Pada Pudana Siru Amanjari Pada Manjari Pada Semara Sampada Na 
Oh, 
कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 जय रूप स्वामी जय रूप गौस्वामी जय रूप गौस्वामी शील रूप गौस्वामी जय रूप मंजारे जय रूप मंजारे जय रूप मंजारे जय रूप जयो बाबो पराबो पराबो पराय बाबो बाकी से कर बाकी से कर बाकी से कर बाकी प्रभु पाखिल बाकी से कर बाकी प्रभु बाकी प्रभु पाखिल बाकी से कर जाती प्रभु भाषे जाती प्रभु राधा माधव राधा माधव राध माधव राध माधव श्री राधे जय रो राध माधव राध माधव श्री राधे भक्ति सिद्धांत सरस्वती गोस्वामी महाराज की जाए श्री गोस्वामी प्रभुपाद की जाए श्री श्री पंच छात्र की जाए श्री श्री आदो माधव की जाए गौर प्रेम आनंदी श्री श्री गुरु एंड श्री गौरांग हरि ओ क्विकली वीट द ट्रांसलेशन एंड वी गोट गो पैक एंड गेट रेडी टू गो सो दिस सॉम अनुरोधम दास ठाकुर द लोटस फीट Of Sri Rupa Manjari, Rupa Goswami is eternal form as a gopi of Raj. On my real wealth, we look for wealth. Some a devotee I was talking to today said there's two things that people really, you know, say are find reasons to undermine others or to fight with others over. And one of them is certainly wealth, isn't it? Most of the wars in the world are fought over wealth, so-called wealth, property, literally money, gold, and proprietorship. In other words, proprietorship. And the other is 
a little bit more, you could say, sensual, very common also. Fighting over sex, attraction to a girl or a boy, fighting. People kill each other over this. Wars are fought over this also. Quarrels, dissension, people's lives are ruined. Everyone's probably experienced the different degrees of this in their lives. These two illusions, I am the enjoyer and I am the proprietor, two big illusions. And people think if I acquire, if you're a man that is, wealth and women, my life is successful. The woman I want, or women I want. And wealth, no end of wealth, you never have enough. Even if you have a billion, it's always not enough. It's the unique thing about these particular objectives, so to speak, is that you're never satisfied. Even if you have the woman of your dreams, is still you're not satisfied. Even if you have all the wealth and honor in the world, you're still not satisfied. It's Maya. And still we're aspiring, and still we try, try, try. We keep doing this lifetime after lifetime. We never learn our lessons. We think the real wealth lies in material acquisition or material enjoyment. All of our studies for that reason, even our behavior to try to impress others, try to get our goals, and still we're not satisfied because everyone's doing the same thing. So everyone's like, you know, cutting. We're willing to cut each other's throats if you're getting in my way. I will find fault in you somehow or another. Rumor, better false story. Something they, in English we say, give a dog a bad name and hang it. In the material world, it's like this practically. But here we see the real wealth is not that. There's a, a quick story I'll tell. One great devotee is a, a very close associate of Radhanath Swami before he joined Hare Krishna movement. Huh? He was living in Vrindavan as a sadhu. You know he's from America. And he is very one of his closest friends, there was a senior devotee who was like teaching him and guiding him. His name was Ganesham, he was a local Babaji there, basically living in Vrindavan. And he lived so austerely, he slept on the stone floor, he never even had a sheet for him. Just lay on the floor and slept. He would eat only what people gave him, and generally it was just chapatis. And he Dradna said he never even saw him eat it. He said, No, no, I'm eating so much. So he said so Radna saw he would put it into the into the cupboard. So he opened up this cupboard in the wall. He was living in someone's courtyard, the temple courtyard. And he had his deities in a hole in the wall. And it was like a cupboard he'd keep these little things in. So one day he opened the cupboard and all the chapatis all fell out onto them. They were all piled up in there. He wasn't eating. He was practically not eating. He would never accept service from anyone even though he was old. He would never accept service. Absolutely incredible renunciate and devotee of the Lord. But when eventually, and he would never say where he came from or how he ended up there. He would never talk about himself. But one day one lady, and also like a sadvi, she turned up, the elderly lady, and she started living nearby, renunciate. She spoke English also. He also spoke English. And rather than saw her, and it appeared that there was something going on there between, not sexual in any way, but they seemed to know each other. And uh, he asked her what was going on. He said, actually, I was married. we were married before, many, many moons ago. I've just renounced my whole life now and come to Vrindavan. But many years ago, decades ago, they were married, he said. She said. And she said, well, they were, yeah. And they, she said, when he was very young, we were, he, was a, he was actually, this Ganesham, she said, was the prince of the kingdom in Rajasthan. He was to be the next king. And one day his father, the king and the queen, and, and uh, he and I, we all came to Vrindavan for pilgrimage. And when we were here, he fell in love with Vrindavan. And he decided never to leave. His parents did everything they could to get him to leave Vrindavan. But he wouldn't leave. And then she said that actually last chance he got. The father said, look son, if you don't come to your senses and now come with us back to Rajasthan to be the next king, 
you will be a poverty-stricken beggar for your whole life. Don't you realize that? And the Ganesham, his son, looked at him and said, he picked up one grain of dust from Vrindavan. And he said, you see this grain of dust? This one grain of dust in Vrindavan is more valuable than all the wealth of the universe. What do I care of a petty kingdom in Rajasthan? And that was the last they saw him. Probably. So we don't realize that the real wealth is not what we see with these mundane eyes. Something within. They are the object of my bhajan, bhajan and puja. They are the treasure of my heart. I probably said the instructions of his spiritual master is life and soul. And they're the or my ornaments and the life of my life. They're all that matters to me. Is the, all the Acharya said is that my spiritual master's instructions are all that matter. I don't care if I suffer. The only important thing is to follow the instructions of my spiritual master. They are the reservoirs of all rasa for me and the fulfillment of all my desires. They don't even ask for anything. Every single thing is fulfilled. All perfections are attained by dedicating oneself to the instructions of the spiritual master. They are the conclusion of the religion of the Vedas for me and the goal of all my vows, austerities and the chanting of my mantra. They are the goal to follow those instructions. They are the purpose of all my religious activity. By the power of those feet, my activities will become favorable to devotion. This completely takes shelter of the spiritual masters and a life becomes perfect. Spiritual perfection will be achieved. And with these two eyes I should be able to actually see. We can't see right now. When we come before the day, there may be hopefully some attraction there. We can't actually see Krishna as such. But Krishna is seeing us. He's the seer. We, we are the seen. He's seeing us. He's seeing our hearts. He's seeing our intentions. He's seeing how we behave with each other, how we behave in, the, in every way. He's noting how we behave, how we... what is our attitude, everything. The exquisite beauty of Sri Rupa Manjara's divine feet will shine at the brilliant full moon upon the lotus of my heart both day and night, thus giving relief to my afflicted soul. By the venom of the snake of separation from you has enfeebled my soul. Not something wrong, maybe but the venom. Um, but the venom of the snake of separation from you has enfeebled my soul. And my life is ever afflicted and distressed. This feeling of separation from that Perfection of life to, to take shelter of the lotus feet of Rupa Manjari or to take shelter of the lotus feet of the spiritual master's instructions, etc. is a burning pain of separation to be separated from that personality. And this intensifies, intensifies, intensifies our devotion. O Rupa Manjari, please be merciful and give me the shade of your lotus feet. Narottam Das has taken refuge. Shri Narottam Das Thakur Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you all very much. We're going to have to go upstairs now. Finish off the packing. Um, and there are some devotees coming with us tonight, I believe, to Malaysia. Are they here? No, they're, Raman is here. Where are the, where's the rest of the party? Are they here? Where's Raj? Getting ready, probably. Raj Kishore. Where's, where's, uh, huh? Jagabandhu's on the altar. He, he's worshipping the deity till just before we leave. Huh? I hope he's going to be ready. We want to leave. Uh, who, who, what time are we leaving? Are you driving us, Adi? What time are we leaving? 